Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. Today, I'm very happy to have with me author Joelle Jackson. She is the author of the book Unlock Your Conscious Leadership liberate your four key parts, mind, heart, body, and talent. Uh, Joelle Jackson is a certified professional coach who helps individuals, groups, and communities liberate their whole self from the status quo, unconsciously choose to lead themselves and others to their goals and dreams. Jackson was selected as one of the top 20 coaches in Sacramento in 2021. Uh, hi, Joel. I'm so happy to have you here on the podcast and thank you for agreeing to chat with me. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be connecting with an old friend that I haven't seen in years. Yeah, me too. It's like it's been like what 10 years. Yeah, you you moved uh, to a different coast and uh, we miss you guys. <laughs> but uh, we're glad uh, we you know, we get to chat and I'm so excited and happy about your book. I finished it and I read it and I feel like you know, I like benefited from it and I feel you know, I learned a lot from it. So um, I'm not gonna hug the conversation. Uh, the audience here are to hear from you. So the first thing is Tell us, what is this book about? So I, you know, when I started as a coach, I discovered tools and techniques and, uh, and ways about going or ways around going about life that help us feel more empowered, help us feel more that we are in control of our lives. We are the captains of our own ship, the masters of our own destiny which was something that I had not really realized earlier before I became a coach. And I felt a need and a desire to share that with the world, this message of self-empowerment. So I started working on the book um, maybe six years ago when we moved to California. Um, also as a way to kind of leverage the work that I'm doing, um, help with my brand as a coach and with my focus on liberating oneself from the status quo. And then, you know, you know, as you know, be, being a working mom and owning my business like you, it, there are a lot of distractions. So it's really hard to find the time to sit down and write. And, you know, I've heard other mom authors that say, oh, get up and make the time. You know, I was writing at 4 a.m. I'm like, no, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get up at 4 a.m. and write. But so then the pandemic hit and I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. So a lot of people were forced to go within, you know, um, within their homes and um, be with their families and they were forced to look within. So not where they in, in lockdown, but they were also forced to look within, look at, our, at their lives and begin to ask themselves questions around how much am I really living my life in alignment with what is most important to me? Mm -hmm. What are my top whys? You know, if you know that Simon Sinek uh, talk on start yeah, with the yeah. book. So um, a lot of people begun to realize um, that they're really not living their life in alignment with their values. They're not living their lives in integrity because that is essentially what that means. And, you know, as we then saw, this led to the great resignation because mm -hmm. people were like, forget it. We're not going back to status quo empty. We are going to create a different life. But many of them were lost. They didn't even know where to start. They're like, okay, I'll maybe get another job or start my own business. But when we want to change our lives, we would want to dig deep and liberate four key parts of ourselves. Um, but I just want to take a step back. Yes, the book is titled Unlock Your Conscious Leadership. And conscious leadership here and how it, it ties into everything I'm saying is this act of leading ourselves, leading our thoughts, emotions, and actions consciously. It's choosing thoughts and emotions and actions that empower us that make us feel that we are creating our reality. We are shaping the life that we want. And a lot of people, they, they discover this wisdom and they begin to do it. And, you know, at first they're like, yeah, they hear all these inspirational speakers telling them, change the way you think, think positively. And I've been there, but then, you know, you're changing the way you think, you're, you're, you're thinking positively, but not too much is changing in your life. 
So I discovered the reason why not too much is changing in your life, even though you're choosing to lead yourself consciously or to become a conscious leader, is because there are those four key parts of yourself that are still stuck in the status quo that need liberating, that need to be, you need to hone in on, on them and do the work around them, maybe one, two or more all, or all of them in order for you to be truly a conscious leader. Because if you want to lead yourself consciously, but then you, your heart is closed or you're too much in the head or you're ignoring your physical well-being or you're stuck in a, in a, in a career or you're not unleashing your, your skills and passion, nothing is really going to change at, at your core. You have to work on all these parts of your whole self mm -hmm. in order to change your life. Again, there's a lot of concepts that interchange here and overlap but it's essentially you cannot become who you want to be a conscious leader unless you work on liberating your whole self uh, thank you that's um you know that's very insightful so you started the book um telling uh, about your story working for someone who was a traditional leader was not a conscious leader and how it affected you personally um and how lucky you were naive when you started the journey so in this case, what if you work for someone who's not a conscious leader, you are facing this obstacle and how can you liberate yourself if you are uh, bound by these circumstances of working someone who does not think like you, who's still with the mindset um, of, of the traditional leader, uh, especially if you're still not ready to take the jump and join the great resignation movement. So you're still working for someone. So that is a great question. I can't say it will be easy to want to be a conscious leader and work for an unconscious leader or be doing your work to become a conscious leader and be stuck in a situation where you are faced with unconscious people. But the whole, the beauty of being a conscious leader is that you truly become the change you want to see in the world. And it's all rooted in your ability to begin to look at the world and look at yourself differently. When you begin to look at yourself and the world differently and consciously, you begin to exude a different energy. Mm -hmm. and that energy not only is inspiring you and motivating you to get up every morning and take on the day because you know you're living in alignment with your values, but it's also going to inspire those around you. The hope is that you will inspire that person who's around you to become more conscious, but it's not guaranteed because I tried it, you know, in this <laughs> journey of me being a coach, starting my own business. And, you know, it's like a roller coaster. You have moments where like, oh my gosh, you know, my business is not going like I want it to go, but I have all these expenses. I need to get a job. And then you go get a job and you find yourself stuck back where you were before you became a coach or for me. And you're like, what am I doing? you know, this is not the environment that I want to work in. So then I quit. And that happened to me twice, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, but I truly believe in this, uh, this principle that, you know, Gandhi uh, is, is uh, you know, said, be the change you want to see in the world, hence mm -hmm. this behind me. Um, I Because it conscious leadership, you know, is something I just want to like, uh, uh, just highlight this idea that I learned about conscious leadership through IPAC coaching, which is the coaching school that I attended. And IPAC has conducted a ton of surveys and research around it to, 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 um, uh, to show the evidence, science-based research, to show the evidence that conscious leadership works in terms of this idea that when we change our energy, which is basically the way we think, feel, and act, or consciousness or attitude, when we change our energy, we change the world around us. So when we go work for someone who's unconscious, there's a chance we could change it depending on how many of us around us is actually like us, but some people will not change. And then the the um, the onus is on us on whether or not we want to accept the situation um, or change the way uh, change it if we have the ability to change it or walk away from it. But that is the conscious choice to mm -hmm. to make you know make those choices know know that we have those options and then pick one of them and not feel 
and not feel like we are at the effect of the situation. Because once we begin to feel that we are a victim or that we, you know, we move into also this, uh, you know, anger, frustration, irritation, then we are not being conscious. Um, anytime we're feeling basically that we are in survivor mode, fight, flight, freeze, or appease, we're not being conscious. And then that is not doing us any good and it's not doing anyone around us any good. Um, I was uh, I was chatting um, earlier with my dad this morning and I was telling him that, you know, I'm going to have uh, uh, Joel um, uh, on the podcast and we were, were talking about all the concepts in the book. And he mentioned something that made me think, you know, like my dad is like a traditional Arab dad, so he can be a bit skeptical of, of some of the ideas. And he's like, what is what's uh, like, what would be her reaction to what's happening now in Ukraine? How can you have a choice on that? And how can you make a conscious decision when there is, you know, like all of these tools might not apply in a situation like a war or death or bigger tragedies? So. Um, if you have, and since both you and me come from um, a Middle Eastern background, so uh, like skepticism is uh, is rampant. It's improving these days, and I wrote an article about it. But still, skepticism is about uh, issues of personal development is um, is is still there. So, wh- how would you answer someone who would bring bigger issues, like or or major life tragedies, like war and death, and how we can apply these tools? That's an excellent question because, of course, people will tell you, what are you talking about? How is it that we, you know, you're saying, you know, that we create our reality through the way we think and feel. However, how in the world were we creating this, this tragedy? You know, and as a person who grew up in Lebanon and I spent all my childhood and teenage years in Lebanon, so through the the worst parts of the Lebanese civil war, I can tell you, of course, we didn't create that through our own, you know, way of thinking and feeling. Um, At the same time, things happen collectively, you know, it's the collective that is actually creating. So it's not just the individual. Now, we, again, we are put in a place where we have a choice. Do we want to feel like we are at the effect of the situation? And it's, of course, it's, it's, I wouldn't say human, it wouldn't be human not to say that, yes, I'm going to feel like I'm a victim or, you know, I'm suffering. But at the same time, one of the principles that I was introduced to through IPAC is this idea that pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. So um, I believe that it's, you know, we will be finding ourselves in any aspect of life at times struggling or mistreated or um, um, I'm not going to say suffering because suffering is a choice, but we're going to feel that we're mistreated or we're going to feel that we are living in a tragedy or a war. But, you know, there's the, what, you know, what will make us feel empowered is this idea of whether or not we choose to suffer. Mm -hmm. or we're going to change our mindset and our attitude uh, towards what we're experiencing. So you think about, for example, Nelson Mandela. He was in jail for how many years? Like 20 years? 20 years, yeah, something like this, yeah. But he managed to overcome that difficulty and challenge in his life with his attitude, you know, Mm -hmm. he studied um, and was able to work on his self-development and many other people who suffer in different ways, whether it's a physical disability or um, any sort of tra- tragedy, because again, being conscious is being able to focus on this idea that um, challenges and difficulties in life are always going to happen, but they always present us with opportunities. Mm-hmm. So are we going to be focused on the problem can you see it yeah i see it or the solution Mm -hmm. we really choose which side we want to look at yeah and this reminds me of one of my favorite books um by uh victor frankel i'm I'm sure you're very familiar uh Mm -hmm. with with his work i mean like uh his his book really changed um my outlook especially when i was going through a very hard time um so yeah and uh i have a story for you i was kind of i'm saving it as a surprise uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if you remember it but 
like oh, more than 10 years ago where you, when while you were in the process of being certified uh you gave me a coaching session and I ten did? you I did don't remember. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't remember. so until now i think about that coaching session and you told me something and during that coaching session that you were telling me like you know, I was like working, I, I don't remember what I, what I was doing back then, but you know, just a regular job. And uh, we were talking about our passion. And then you started asking me, what do you like? And I told you some stuff and I told you like writing and, and then it was like, Natasha, I can hear it from your voice. Your voice, the tone of your voice changed when you mentioned writing to me. And this sentence like resonated for me, like every time I think, what do I want to do with my life? I remember this sentence and here we go. 10 years uh, later, I'm a full-time writer uh, pursuing what I love. And it's, you, you heard it, you, like you heard it in my voice. And th this was, um, you know, just to tell you that how you know you you influence people one of them is me and i'm, I'm, I'm pursuing that and i will always remember this and i'm sure you forgot it but it, it, it resonates that makes, with me that makes me so happy but that's exactly what i'm talking about when it's when we talk about unleashing our talent yeah yeah you, know, you unleashed your talent you do you decided to believe in that in the fact that you have a talent when it comes to writing and you pursued it and i mean how do you feel now that you're able to live that um i'm extremely happy and you know for me is there's you know i'm sure you're familiar with the term the sunday blues which is you know people like on sunday evening they get really like stressed energy and, and energy down because the next day is monday they're gonna go back to the office and i used to suffer massively from the sunday blues i, I won't be able to sleep insomnia like heart palpitation now i cannot wait for monday morning i mean like su my sunday night is awesome like i'm reading and excited and i can't wait to wake up in the morning drink my coffee and work on the stuff that i like and for me that indication of of battling this the sunday blues syndrome is really indication of 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 i'm, I'm pursuing what i like of, of unleashing the talent as you mentioned in your book so just can i comment on that you know what actually i talk about it in the book but that is exactly what you're going through it's this idea you you've discovered your why mm -hmm. and i tell my clients your why is like the trunk of a tree okay, okay. it keeps grounded and anchored and rooted and all your choices, decisions, and actions, they grow out of the tree like the branches of the tree. Mm -hmm. So the more you are aligned with your why, with your values, and making all your choices and decisions and actions rooted in your values, life is going to feel really good. And it's not going to feel like you're coming from a place of I have to, I should, I must. There's no more shoulds. Mm -hmm. Only want to. Want so to. When you wake up Monday morning, you're like, I love this. This is yeah. what I want to do this doesn't feel like work because i'm living my values i'm living i'm unleashing my talent i'm putting my skills and passion to work so why wouldn't you want to get up on monday morning it'll feel great and that's for me for me my work is not work my my work is fun you know every time i get on a call with a client no matter how challenging the situation may be but the mere fact that i feel that i'm helping them i'm help helping to guide them to that inner genius within them that has all the answers to their questions and all the solutions to their problems, the more gratified I feel because I truly feel, yes, I'm be making a change and I'm helping them be the change they want to see in the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've witnessed it, so I'm a huge believer. Um, I want to go back to the issue of the, the great resignation. Um, this morning, I get an email. I always get like email from PR agencies or uh, publishers who want me to talk about their book or if they want me. So one of them is telling me, are, uh, we saw that you wrote about the great uh, resignation. Are you interested in interviewing our CEO who has a strategy to beat the great resignation? So there are, I feel there are two kind of ways of thinking now. There are those who are like all gun ho about the great resignation. You know, the idea of nine to five is is uh, pretty antiquated. Something came like uh, 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 as like because of the industrial revolution and um, creation of factories and after World War Two, we all revolved. But uh, the nine to five concept stayed the same, and we should basically eradicate it. And we are all 
we can all be like uh like us uh what do you call us solo entrepreneurs uh yeah, yeah. yeah and so this is one one way of thinking the other school of thought is no we can reform the workplace um and so we can uh, change the great resignation to a great retention so where do you stand in this do you think that you know it's like the concept of working for leaders um is is not applicable anymore uh because many of them are not conscious leaders and it's and and we all of us went through the pandemic and reassessed what we want or you think that no there is hope in in salvaging the nine to five structure great question because i talk about it in my last chapter um yeah. It, yeah. I, i'm an, i'm I'm a believer in the latter, that we need to turn this into a great retention. We are being presented with an opportunity to change the paradigm. And I mean, we do. It's unfortunate that we have to have something as tragic as a pandemic to force us to change the way we go about our work and our work policies. But, you know, before the pandemic, I felt like I was just like one of very few people who were coaching around this concept of conscious leadership. And for many, it seemed very foreign. Um, I mean, you had people like Jeff Weiner at LinkedIn. I don't mm -hmm. know where he is now. I don't know if he's still at LinkedIn, but you know, very few people talked about being conscious leaders. They talked about, you know, always trying to look at another person with, with compassion and empathy, uh, trying to give the other person the benefit of the doubt, not to judge, to discern. And, you know, we lack that. We lack the heart in the way we do our work. It's very much of a head-based approach. And whenever you are only focused on one of your parts, the head and not the heart, there's a state of imbalance. And I think that is the, the reason why so many people were not happy prior to the mm. pandemic. And then the pandemic gave them that, that you know, impetus to want to ask for change. Um, we we would want to look again at the paradigm of how we work in this country. And the mere fact that we were forced to change it has given the leverage needed to make the argument that yes, it works. It works to get, you know, have a flexible schedule. It works to work from home. People will not slack off. You know, in fact, the studies and the data has shown that people tend to be more productive when you are giving them that flex schedule and you're giving them, you know, the ability to work from home. Um, and especially for working parents, you know, as mm -hmm. I can't imagine the life you had. I remember the, the commuting into DC on the metro and then coming back home. And now you have three kids, right? Because yeah, I, I have, have, three have kids. one more after I left. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> How can, you know, we won't, we, this is, you know, uh, limiting our ability to tap into the talent, particularly of working moms. And that is going to affect our economy, our, our ability as a country to unleash our potential even more. So at the end of the day, we would want to think win-win. The way we were thinking before is unconscious. It's about I win, you lose. They think that by just hiring you and paying you money that you're happy. But when you're just struggling and you're not able to be your best self, because once you are your best self, you can be more productive and unleash your potential if you're not able to be that then you're actually not winning you're losing and they're losing with you mm -hmm. so i guess they have to they have to or they'd want to i try to catch myself using the words yeah. words have to and should but employers nowadays they would want to, but they're also being forced to look at things differently. And yes, some of them are going to be open to it because they have a growth mindset and others are going to dig in their heels and say, nope, I'm not going to do it. But I believe those are the ones that are going to be left behind because there is the tipping point. And I feel that more people would want to change the way they look at things and do things because more and more people want things differently. And then you look at the Generation Z. They are so different even than the millennials. They want that. And that is the future. We can't avoid it. Well, um, then I'm going to play the devil's advocate here since you brought Generation Z and the generation differences. 
So the devil's advocate is about work ethics. So people would say the difference between the work ethics of uh, Generation X versus millennials. I'm going to focus on that. So you have the Generation X where like, I'm going to work until I die and I'm going to retire and you're going to give me the money, whatever you say. There. And then the, the you have the millennial who like, I can't do that. I need a mental health break. This is a toxic environment and all these these kind of uh, cultural um, changes to the workplace or requirements that Generation X did not ask for or did not care, care for, and they just wanted, they had this kind of work ethic, uh, uh, like a, you know, nine to five, I do the job, I, I get paid, I retire, and that's it. So I heard criticism about from Generation X that millennials do not have the work ethic that is needed now for the workforce and they they use you know terms like i need a mental health break so that they not work as hard as generation x so i'm just playing the devil's advocate here I'm not, yeah so what i want to uh, just take you back to is this point i make in the book we all look at life from our own lens that's right. been shaped and conditioned by the way we've brought up been brought up by our social constructs, by our culture, by our ethnicity, even by our language, they say it affects the way we look at life and ourselves. Generation Xers, they grew up in a certain kind of world. And that's the way they looked at life, right? Yeah. And here comes the mill mill millennials are actually now some of them are in their 40s. 40s yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the, the young ones anymore, like when I was working, you know, the millennials yeah. were like 20s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, they're not. They're old now. And they brought they were brought up in a somewhat of a different world. So they have a different lens. We can be hung up on judgment and labeling them as, oh, what, you know, what a lazy crowd they are and you know, they don't want to work and look at us, we're hardworking. But what we would want to ask ourselves is, what do we really want? And I can, yeah, I can guarantee you that no one amongst them, I mean, maybe there would be people and in the Generation X generation or Generation X group that would, um, that would be like, you know, not many would say, I want to I want to keep doing doing things the way I've been doing it because I can guarantee you not everybody is happy. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, we would want to be honest with ourselves and say, are we more hung up on this idea of judging the, the millennials or would we want to look more at our lives and ask ourselves how happy, how fulfilled, how healthy am I? Because, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I can't see how a Generation Xer would say I'm happy with the way things are going, that I'm burnt out, basically, yeah. that I'm not being able to be present with my kids when I'm at home, because my head is always at work, that I don't have time to go to the gym or take a walk with my wife, or, you know, whatever, this idea of work-life balance or work-life integration. So, Whenever we experience a shift or a change, we're going to see things swing from one end of the spectrum to the other end, just like a pendulum, right? It swings from one end to the other end until it settles somewhere right there in the middle, right? Yeah. So we are in this process of a major shift. And of course, we're going to see the extremes and the extremes are kind of overwhelming, like, oh my gosh, you know, how is it that we were doing this way? And they want to look at them. All they want is a mental health day. But no, I think the outcome of this shift, if we can allow ourselves to sit and not judge and allow things to happen and maybe contribute to them positively by looking for those conscious leadership uh, or advocating for conscious leadership approaches such as let's create a win-win workplace, let's create a play workplace where people are not um, being um, uh, uh, led by this fear-based ideas of command and control or approaches of command and control, manipulation and intimidation, but rather inspiration and motivation that is rooted in and uh, aligning in values of empowering the individual of power with instead of power over, which is something I learned from another teacher that I had. Her name is Judith Glaser. She wrote the book, Conversational Intelligence. But again, it's power with instead of power over. If we can be advocates for all of these principles that are part of conscious leadership, we will eventually help the collective move more into that middle where I believe is a win-win. That's where we all want to be. 
Well, well said. So now well, when answers <laughs> all the time, I'm sorry, I get really passionate about these things. No, no, of course, of course. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is great. That's what this podcast is all about, is just to, to share ideas and, and bounce them back and forth. So I'm just going to shift to your writing process uh because part of this podcast is as well to talk about the writing process and the publishing process just to help um uh, writers and and, and uh, aspiring authors so for me like there's been a huge amount of of research in in this book done um and i'm curious to hear about how long um it took you to finish this book and what was your research mechanism and how did you capture these ideas like did you keep a notes system all through the years and then uh, you went back to it or you know you just collected these notes as you were writing so i'm just curious about your 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 writing process and how long it took you thank you thank you for pointing out there's a lot of research because you know having gone to grad school and then I read a lot of psychology books, I, you know, my inner critic was like, I better back this up with the research because mm -hmm. then people will not take me seriously, right? Yeah. What I did is that every time I, I heard something or read something or I thought of something, I was using my smartphone to just put a note in. Okay. And I was just like adding notes and then I added notes also on my in, in, in a draft message on my email that was the initial stage okay but then as the idea of how the book I want to structure the book began to crystallize for me then I created word documents and I you know it wasn't too clear at the beginning like how many chapters what do I want to talk about First, you know, I had maybe one main master document, but as the the book be, began to take the shape that it, it ended up with, then I split them up into each chapter. And under each chapter, I began to plug in like links to articles, ideas that I had, I wanted to discuss. But I wouldn't say it was like a perfect uh, science because at the end of the day, I just found myself you know, I'm, I'm going to write the introduction. And I just went for it. Mm -hmm. But there were many times too, that I would go back and change things around and I would add and I would shift things around. And the last four, uh, five chapters that I, in, in which I talk about, about the stages of um, liberation, I, they, they came later. So I didn't really think of them initially. So I just added them. In a way, it had like a method to the madness, and in, in another way, it was, you know, it didn't. <laughs> it okay. Just very organic. <laughs> okay. And and how many years? Like, what was the period of of writing the whole thing and and finishing it, and you know, to publishing it? So I started jotting things down. I would say in 2015, late uh -huh. 2015, early 2016, when we moved to California. Um, but then I didn't really focus uh, a ton on it until the pandemic. So yeah. That was 2020. Yeah. And you um, self published this book. And yeah. um, a number of authors now are like skipping the gatekeepers. Uh, they're not even bothering with publishers. And they go to the root of, of self publishing it. So what why did you self-publish is it because you don't want to deal with an agent a publisher or uh it was hard to find one or you just went directly to the to the root of of self and how was the whole experience self-publishing your book um so what i what happened is i ended up i think it was last year around this time of year i ended up taking a workshop with hay house publications they publish a lot of these self-help books and they published all the books by Louise Hay, because she's the person who founded that, that publishing house. And Louise Hay inspired me and also Wayne Dyer. So I'm like, why don't I go and see what they have to offer? Because they also offer the workshops. I was like, let me see what they have to say. And so when I attended the workshop, I discovered that, you know, yeah, it sounds cool to have, you know, a publisher publish your book. But even if they accepted my, my proposal, it might take two years for my book to get published. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not into this to make money. Yeah. I'm not into this to spread a message. And I can do this. So I'll just do it. And I wasn't sure how, but I'm like, yeah, people self-publish. I mean, they talked about it a little bit in, in the workshop because they have Balboa Press. And they also offer people to self-publish through Balboa Press. Um, 
but then I did my research and I, I met my wonderful editor who was actually Palestinian American too. I love empowering women too. So, yeah. she, and um, she helped me, like, she was like, why don't you try Amazon KDP? I'm like, mm. okay. And, you know, at first it was a bit overwhelming because you're like, oh gosh, I have to do all this by myself, but it wasn't as bad. I think the hardest part in all of it was getting the documents formatted in a way that would work with uploading them. Yeah. To tape. yeah. And, and everything else was not that bad. And did, did you format it yourself or did you hire, like, hire someone to do the formatting for the the for the the paperback copy i did it myself and also for the kindle with the kindle i was almost done with it and i was about to hire someone and i'm like forget it i'll just finish it i kind of have this you know this tendency to just want to like keep persevering until i get it done because i'm like i can do this yeah <laughs> it's like the best use of your time so if anybody is interested in writing their book you know, I would recommend they look into someone else to do these things for them because it will save them the time. But for me, I kind of got a little bit compulsive about finishing it <laughs> <laughs> on my own timeline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I dabbled a bit with KDP um, and the formatting is is not easy. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to self-publish my second book. So these are also <laughs> questions for me. Yeah, but uh, thank you. Um, so what about the the writing process in terms of did you write every day you know you're a working mom kids family house social obligation what was your routine writing routine so for me i felt like my energy was the best like is the optimal for writing after i'm done with my calls and i'm done with taking care of my kids okay by four o'clock in the afternoon when the kids are like doing homework or winding down because they were actually at home at that time yeah. so they would be online school all day four o'clock they may be watching a show or doing an activity and they're a little bit older now so they can be independent um i would just sit down and work in my office and i would maybe tell myself i'm gonna write for an hour an hour and a half every day and that was it and that that's how i went about it there were times when I just felt like, oh, you know, so unmotivated and it's normal. Mm -hmm. But the more you can think about the end goal and one of my end goals was I wanted to get it done by Christmas of 2021 so that people can have it in their stockings. Okay. And I can gift it to people. So even though it was like really a race against time, we, I managed to get it done. It wasn't perfect at that point. Not that perfection ever exists. Perfection is an illusion. Mm -hmm. But I had to go back and do a few tweaks to it after the fact. But you having a goal and trying to work towards that goal and taking it baby steps, I think was really helpful for me. Hmm. And being realistic on what you can do and not trying to measure yourself against what other people do. Like the woman who said she wakes up at 4 a.m. Yeah, but probably she goes to bed like at eight. Yeah. You know? So can you go to bed at eight? You know, no. like, is yeah, I mean, it's, People have different circumstances as well. Um, so in terms of the reception, what was the reception to the book? And uh, what was the feedback? Um, did you get any negative feedback? And if you did, how, how did you deal with it? So far, the feedback has been very encouraging and very positive. And even if it wasn't positive, I, I try to coach myself because I want to be truly the, 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 the um, lead by example. I try to coach myself that this is a learning opportunity. I've never written a book before and not that everybody's going to resonate with it. There are people who may not like it and that's okay. That's okay because they have a different lens. I'm not here trying to convince people to think about the world the way I do but I'm gonna be true to my authentic self and I'm gonna speak my truth. And if they like it, great. If they don't, okay, you know. So I was talking with someone uh, about books and publishing and she said that she would never publish a book because she won't be able to handle the feedback. And that if she get a one star review on Goodreads, she would like collapse, you know, and she would. So how would you coach uh, authors who get one star or zero stars or really like uh, uh, negative feedback, especially in, in main publications where, and I, you know, uh, I've seen it everywhere. So how would you coach them? What would you tell them? 
so that kind of I like uh, a similar like um, a situation comes up when you're coaching people around performance reviews oh. and they have like a slew of positive feedback or in 360 um, evaluations they get all this positive feedback and then one or two comments in the feedback is kind of like constructive or if you want to label it as negative or whatever and everyone gets hung up on it yeah. right we all do me yeah. included right that because we have a tendency as human beings, a psychology called negativity bias. Mm -hmm. we, all, we all look at the negative instead of looking at the positive. That's conscious leadership. Again, it's opportunity to look for the positive instead of being fixated on the negative, shift our attention to the positive. That's one part of it. The other part of it, if you write something and people don't like it, don't let that define you. Your worth is not really hinging upon what other people think of you. Your worth hinges upon how you think about yourself. If you're living in alignment with your values and trying to be your best self and trying to be essentially a person who's conscious, you know, trying to do good and be the presence of good in the world, whether people resonate with that or not, it's their problem. And so it's not about I don't care, but in a way, yes, it is I don't care because I care more about living my truth than trying to fit in and conform. Now, if people are trying to write a book to make money off of it, you know, yeah, they may be disappointed that they didn't get the feedback that they wanted because that's going to affect the sales of the book. But when you live also in a state of detachment where you're like doing what you love and being, you know, just, just speaking your truth and being authentic and not expecting anything in return, just like not having any expectations, it's freeing. Yeah. But if you're like working with just this idea, oh, I want people to like it. And if they don't like it, my whole world will come, will come crashing down. Of course, you're going to be depressed. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. So in terms of the authors or the thinkers that influenced you, I noticed there's a, you know, a lot of references to Rumi, to Gibran, Khalil Gibran, uh, to them, some of the Greek Stoicism, like Marcellus. Um, so I'm just um, curious to hear about who are the, the thinkers that, and authors that influenced you. It's a blend basically of spirituality, of psychology, of metaphysics, of self-empowerment. I mean, Wayne Dyer, I love Wayne Dyer. Viktor Frankl, I mean, you mentioned him, but I have to say this quote is my favorite. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, and that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That is like a prayer to me. I love yeah. that quote. And also the quote by Carl Jung. I mean, Carl Jung, I've read some of his work. It's kind of dense. But I love Carl Jung because he was one of the pioneers in terms of talking about the unconscious and the conscious. Unless you make the unconscious conscious, it's going to rule your life and you will call it fate. Yeah. A lot of us live like that, thinking, oh, this is, this is my destiny, like life is happening to me. But then we forget that we're operating um, with, you know, up, up to 98% of where we're operating from is from the unconscious mind. So, yeah, I did like with you know, psychology, spirituality, metaphysics, self-development, and anytime I would run or come across anything that I felt would tie into, you know, the concepts that I wanted to share in the book, I would write it down. I would take a picture of it and save it in my, in, with my photos so that I, you know, went back. And that was part, again, of gathering all this information. And I wanted, I felt that quotes are very inspiring because you can communicate in a, in a, in a couple sentences or one sentence, a very powerful idea. Yeah, I did the same with your book. I, I took pictures and I saved them in my Evernote uh, capture system, uh, you know, uh, so, so thank you. You mentioned something about fate and coming from society like the middle east faith is a huge concept and many people believe in the concept of qadr in arabic which is faith and there's even um, a saying uh, which means whatever written on your forehead is seen by your eyes so the concept of faith is, is very strong and there's like huge believers of faith and so you can come and you tell them that you are in charge of your own faith. That's like, 
a, a very negative state to, uh, to, to some of those believers. And how, how would you answer those people who really believe in faith? It disrupts their paradigm. That's why it's uncomfortable. Because if you're introducing a new concept to anybody, if they're not ready for it, it's going to feel uncomfortable. And that's totally understandable. At the same time, I think people draw, they, again, they draw their sense of comfort from knowing that they're not always creating their reality. I believe we're co-creating it. We're co-creating it with God, the universe, whatever way you look at it. I mean, for most of us in the Middle East, we believe in God. Yeah. So for us, we're co-creating it with God. We have a free will. That's what free will comes from, this idea that we can choose our destiny. We can mm -hmm. choose our path. And, you know, maybe there are things that are already written, that are part of our fate, but I don't think they're not for the highest good. They're, uh, they're, they're always for our highest good and the highest good of everybody around us. So, the, you know, this idea of release that I talk about in the book, the stage of release, it's this idea of surrendering to the flow of the universe. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we don't do our part. We do our part when we choose to live from higher levels of consciousness, from that place of love and peace and acceptance. So then whatever comes away, our way, we accept. And instead of struggling against it, trying to make things work in the way we think they should work, we allow them. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And I think it takes me to probably one of my last questions before we end is I noticed that you never mentioned or maybe I, I missed it, the word manifest or the law of attraction or, you know, uh, manifestation. And it's it's been big lately, you know, manifestation. I've been reading a lot about it, the law of attraction, you know, I, I guess started with the alchemist and so on and so forth and the book, The Secret and others. Where do you stand when it comes to manifestation? I didn't say the word manifest, but I did say the word create. Correct. Because I wanted to speak to all audiences and I didn't want to only connect with one segment of society that believes in manifestation. I believe manifestation is, is just the same, again, as creating our own reality. But, you know, um, it exists. And we're just, and, you, and that's what brings me back to the quotes. If you read my quotes, you see that all this wisdom about how we create our own reality has been around for ages, for eons, for thousands of years. But we have a tendency as human beings to live in a place of feeling like we are um, at the effect of life, that we have no power over our destiny. But then again, we have free will, like I was just sharing. We have free will to co-create with God whatever reality we want to live in. And that in itself is manifesting. When Jesus in the Bible says that, you know, I'm not good at quoting things verbatim, but the idea, and if you have the faith, the, you know, enough faith, you can move mountains. Isn't that manifestation, basically? Miracles. Oh, that was in the Bible? Oh, interesting. I should go check that out. I, I love the story of Martha and Mary, by the yeah. way, in, in your yeah. book. Uh, so, yeah, it is it is manifestation, but it's interesting that you didn't call it manifestation or, or like law of attraction, which is, I guess, now very trendy these days. It's trendy. I also, I don't, like for people who are very much in the head, they tend okay. to be more skeptical about this yeah. thing. Correct. And I wanted to use science to show them that this stuff is not woo woo. This stuff yes. is real. And we just have to look at it differently, and you'll see the evidence. Yeah. And I guess uh, um, I this is my last question because we're, we're uh, kind of been chatting for an hour. It felt like two minutes for me because it's. That's awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and for me, the idea, which is especially for moms and, or for women in general, doesn't that like the skeptics doesn't that make you selfish you know if you only focus on yourself like the story that you mentioned between is it martha and mary one of them was serving the guest and the other one wanted to go have fun and 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 in the story like jesus sort of excused what um I'm not sure which one martha or mary that wanted to go have fun and you know the skeptic especially when if, if you're a mom and you have kids and you know like oh and I heard it. I heard many people criticize other moms. Ah, oh, she's selfish. She like does not pay attention to her kids. Um, and how would you 
like combats this kind of negative perception of those who pursue happiness? It's not, you know, it's something that comes up all the time with a lot of working moms I coach. And I coach a lot of working moms. It's actually a big part of my coaching practice. It's not about being selfish. Again, it's about being able to fill up your own cup so that you can fill up the cup of others. Like, you know, they say, put on your mask first Uh before you help the person sitting next to you. You have to put on your mask because if you don't have the oxygen to breathe, you cannot live in order to help others. You cannot give away what you don't have. Otherwise, you'll be running on empty. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've seen a lot of our Middle Eastern moms running on empty and you see what happens to them. They're disgruntled sitting in the kitchen cooking and complaining, right? And then it takes a toll on their bodies and they're worn out. I mean, of course, not a lot of them are housewives, but there there are working moms that are just burnt out, just like moms in the West. If you cannot take care of yourself, you cannot take care of others. And that is not selfish. And it's also honoring yourself, honoring the gift that you've been given, this gift of life that you have. Your body is your vessel. You have to take care of it in order to be able to serve and to love and to take care. And plus, you would want to be a role model. What kind of role model are you for your children? Is that really the life that you want them to have? Because You know, we, the clients I work with, most of the time, we're trying to unpack a lot of that programming and conditioning that we got from watching how our parents operate. Mm. We really want our children to operate like us, where we self-sacrifice and self-martyr for others. But then at the end of the day, it's not even a win-win because we're disgruntled and everybody around us feels it. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. So it's it's been a pleasure talking to you, uh, Joelle. And for uh, anyone who's watching or listening, uh, please check out Joelle's book, Unlock Your Conscious Leadership. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned from a lot of, uh, from it, and I'm sure you will too. Any last um, thoughts, uh, Joelle, um, comments, anything you'd like to say to anyone who's listening or watching? I just want to say a big thank you to you, Natasha. I am so inspired by you that you've been able to unleash your talent. And I hope that our stories will inspire others to believe in this idea of living their values and not feel like they have to, should, and must live life in a way to conform, to fit in, to be, to essentially what they want to be feeling is feeling accepted and not rejected but to to have the courage to just step out of their comfort zone because success and happiness and health and fulfillment is always outside of our comfort zone. We just have to believe in ourselves that we can do it and switch the question from, can I do it to put the I before the can and say, I can do it. So that would be my message to everyone and i hope that my book inspires them to step into their highest potential and begin to lead life and live it consciously thank you very much uh joelle and uh thank you everyone for watching or listening to uh read and write with natasha and until uh, next time